Hello, everybody. Welcome to this new uh, episode of the Robustly Beneficial Podcast. Uh, today, we're going to discuss uh, an entry from the, uh, the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called uh, Ethics of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. Uh, so it's quite recent. It was written uh, in the end of in April the 30, uh, 2020. And uh, it's quite a nice overview of many important topics uh, in uh, ethics of uh, AI. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah. So, so the the article starts with uh, some, some background on uh, on the field of of AI, and uh, it stresses the fact that uh, well, it's becoming more and more important, but it's not always clear what are the the, the priorities in terms of AI ethics. Uh, it has concerns that maybe we sometimes focus on wrong things. And it, it argues that it's going to try to, uh, to highlight uh, the, the most important uh, aspects of AI ethics. Uh, and uh, essentially it identified uh, 10 uh, main debates, uh, as it is called. Uh, and maybe we can go through them one by one. So, so the first one was uh, something that uh, is discussed uh, very widely. Uh, it's the problem of privacy and, and surveillance. And uh, this, this is like very, uh, well, very much uh, already uh, debated and it's very much about uh, today's uh, algorithms. Uh, and well, the basic idea is that today if you're using Facebook or, or Google, then uh, Facebook and Google are, and others are collecting a lot of uh, information uh, about what you do. Uh, it can be more, more, more or less personal. And uh, yeah, so th there's this concern that this can allow uh, mass surveillance, especially if like, uh, a government has access to such uh, data, uh, which is likely to be the case uh, in practice, uh, at least in, in, many, in some ca cases. Um, so then there's this problem of how do we design uh, uh, algorithms that are resilient to such uh, issues. Yeah, concerning uh, data, the article also mentioned uh, the question of uh, ownership of personal data. And uh, this is also something that raises a lot of discussion. Uh, the, the way things, uh, things went is that uh, so somehow government and uh, a uh, big institution did not anticipate well enough the the importance of uh, of data and the fact that this social network would be recording things about about everyone and uh, and make make their business out of this and we can say today that we we, we lost ownership of our personal data because uh, it's out there and uh, we are not uh, getting paid uh, paid paid from that but in the in the in the opposite these uh, big companies use this to optimize their algorithms to better target ads and uh, another thing like this. It's something that uh, Yuval Ahari often mentioned that uh, even says that in some cases these algorithms know us better than uh, we know ourselves because they have been able to collect so much information about us and and also the scale of this algorithm because they have information about more than millions even several billions of people they can uh, they can find patterns in that and uh, and make deduction that we as individual with uh, our small observation space uh, we can't. Uh, he, he says he, uh, he often says the example of uh, of the fact that the Coca Cola company was aware that he was gay before he himself was aware and he explained the example of uh, what ad was targeted for him uh, in that case. What I found most interesting was the second point uh, raised by the, in the article, which is about uh, maxim, uh, manipulative behaviors by algorithms. Yep. Uh, so it starts from uh, these algorithms that collect so much data about us that know, that know us, let's say, better than we know ourselves, but also have incentives to, 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 to change us, to, to manipulate us. So, why, why do they have these uh, this incentives? So uh, simply YouTube algorithms is trying to maximize the, the time you spend on YouTube. Facebook, every common system is trying to maximize the time you spend on Facebook. 
and uh, and to to achieve this, it just is is not sufficient to simply uh, show you interesting content. If if the algorithms can choose to show you content that will change you into someone that is more likely to, to, to come back to YouTube or change you into someone that's more likely to come back to Facebook. That's uh, this, these smart algorithms that can test things out of, on uh, millions of people, they, they will necessarily find this kind of uh, content that can change you. And, uh, and they are, and yeah, and so that, that's where the, the concept of uh, manipulation, behavior, manipulative behaviors by algorithms come from. Uh, maybe just to, to, to stress the fact that here, like, often when we hear like manipulation, we tend to think of malice and malicious um, intentions. Uh, so here manipulation is not necessarily an intended, uh, uh, intended objective, but it's just inevitable. If I just put in on an objective function to maximize watch time, and the fastest way to maximize watch time is to put content that makes you come back more often and changes your own preferences, then the algorithm without real intention will manipulate you. Like just like to, to put a caveat because like most people when they hear manipulation they think of intentions. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, first, the first outcome of this is uh, simply uh, ad addictive uh, content. Yeah. So this is something that's highly recommended uh, on, uh, on social media and yeah. highly yeah. shared. And, uh, C cigarettes do not mani they do not have an intention to manipulate you. But smoking the first cigarettes makes you addicted and makes you willing to smoke another cigarette. So it's, yeah. Yeah. maybe addiction is better than manipulation, just to convey the re like the real nature of what's happening. Yeah, so, uh, well, it is not, like, addiction is not the only kind of uh, manipulation we can think of. Uh, but yeah, if you think of the recommender systems uh, themselves, uh, well, the algorithm is not like trying to make sure you become an extremist or something like this. It's just trying to maximize uh, engagement. And, yeah, it's well, just that extremists engage more with the platform. So, yeah. As the side effects of addiction. Yeah. And I, I think uh, it's important to keep, keep in mind that uh, many of the primes of, of algorithms are, are, are rather side effects than uh, malicious intentions or well, at least a lot of them are side effects and not malicious. I mean, the complexity things. of like the tree of all possible side effects is so complex and so intractable that maybe the most economic way of talking about them is just to, to say manipulation. Yeah. yeah. Another thing I wanted to, to raise is that um, like I, I feel like a lot of the words uh, used in the entry uh, like privacy, so surveillance, uh, manipulation are, are highly uh, connoted. Like it, it feels like, for instance, that privacy is, is definitely good, surveillance is definitely bad, uh, uh, manipulation is uh, definitely bad. Uh, we're going to talk uh, afterwards about opacity and, and things like uh, biases. Uh, but I think it's more complex than this. Um, like for, for, for instance, typically, if you can somehow uh, better understand people' uh, mental health uh, conditions using this data, uh, it has to be done well, and it's like uh, very important that this can be that this is done very very well. But there's also opportunities. Uh, also, like you can provide more customized recommendations, um, like the. COVID situation also highlights the fact that, uh, like in, in many countries, uh, at least in, in France, uh, like very contagious uh, diseases uh, have a special uh, legal uh, framing where uh, you essentially have a, a duty to, uh, to report uh, that you are highly uh, contagious if you are. Uh, uh, and so, so that there can be uh, reasons. Uh, it's very touchy and has to be done well, and it's very, very hard. But there can there can be reason to protect uh, uh, most people to 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 well, understand some 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 of the important risks. In the case of of, of like influencing people through algorithms. Um, well, uh, that's what we are doing right now. Like we're trying to influence you into thinking that uh, AI ethics is important. So uh, this is a kind of uh, ma 
manipulation or maybe we would rather call it education. Uh, but th this can be also an impact, like for instance, uh, Tristan Harris from uh, your Undivided Attention uh, podcast uh, often talks about uh, fighting climate change by uh, recommending quality content about climate change and raising awareness uh, through uh, recommender algorithms. So, so that would be a, a kind of, of, of manipulation that could be for, for, for something much more important, uh, which is the future of, of climate and, and thus of mankind. Uh, yeah, so, so clearly bad manipulation is bad, but it's not all clear that all sorts of like uh, trying to influence people are, are bad. Yeah, it's, it's not very clear what, what non-manipulation would, uh, would, would be because yeah. if you go on social, social medias and you, you see content, then it will change you maybe. It would this it would uh, this content will make you stay the the person you are without changing you. But this is this is one part of the platform. Uh, what the what the algorithm selects makes makes you uh, like makes you like this decides that you will not change or decide that you will change in a in its certain way. So I would say as as long as there is a content recommendation, uh, we can uh, we, it's, it's hard to 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 define what non manipulative content recommendation would be. Okay, yeah. good. Go on to the next point. Yeah. So the yeah. the next uh, uh, chapters in the in the article concern uh, the question of uh, biases, and uh, it's something uh, highly discussed uh, concerning artificial intelligence. There there were some some cases. For example, the one we discussed was simply the case of the what comes out when you research for the keyword CEO on a Google image. And a long time ago, it, it showed only photos of, uh, of, of male CEO. And uh, this was considered an important uh, bias problem uh, of the algorithms. Uh, today, it's clearly fixed. Well, on but so, it's fixed on, yeah, it's fixed on, on like, Google, but not really on other search engines. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We did the experiment and uh, actually like a lot of caveats. It's not clearly fixed. Yeah, it's, it's not clearly fixed. And uh, actually, we did the experiment the other day. And uh, well, I did the experiment from from my laptop uh, in private navigation mode. And uh, well, if you search, if I when I search a female uh, uh, just CEO uh, on Google, I did have like uh, twenty thirty percent of the female uh, CEO images. But on other websites uh, like Bing.com, uh, DuckDuckGo, uh, I tried uh, Ecosia, uh, Quant, things like this. Uh, no, there were only male CEOs images. And uh, the only other exception was uh, Yahoo images, which I found uh, uh, interesting. Uh, but yeah, it's not that clear to fix, and it's quite hard to fix. And it's a famous example, so that's why Google fixed mm -hmm. it. But maybe there are more subtle uh, case, cases where it wasn't fixed. Yeah, I expect that uh, this is a complicated problem to know, to know all all the areas in which these kind of things should be fixed. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure Google hasn't uh, hasn't done it uh, well enough already yet. Well enough. Yet. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's the problem of doing this because. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know how Google did this, but uh, one way to do this is by hand, essentially, and you see like one of these very contentious, well, important uh, uh, bias uh, issues, and you detect them and then you fix them by hand. I don't know if what if this is what Google did, but probably it's more or less this. Uh, like usually, you identify uh, uh, what the way debiasing you of. Like the, these debiasing algorithms usually work is that you identify two classes of people and you want them to be equally represented, represented in some uh, in some outputs and you you, you correct for this. But uh, this is usually done by hand and it's a bit ad hoc and there's no systematic way to do this. And this means that we can only debias the cases that we have been able to identify. Uh, and if, especially if by we, we mean uh, humans, uh, it's arguably quite limited. Uh, so I think just the research for more systematic uh, uh, debiasing uh, should, be, should be done. Mm -hmm. And another thing we discussed is that um, 
I actually don't really uh, like the word uh, uh, debiasing because it suggests that there was a, a, a clear bias that we want to that needed to be fixed and then everything is solved. Um, and in, in practice, like many of the, if you look at empirical data, they, the way the world is, is uh, arguably in a certain way is uh, uh, very biased. Like you just look at uh, well, CEOs or mathematicians or computer scientists. Uh, unfortunately, computer scientists, uh, like the three of us are all males. Uh, so it's, it's very, uh, in a certain way, and probably what we want is instead of representing how the world is, uh, at least when like uh, people search for computer scientists on, on image Google, maybe we want to show them uh, more something closer to what we would want the world to, to be like, uh, and and this would mean that would be we would be adding biases to the description of the world. Uh, so. And maybe that's something that we actually want. Uh, I think like we made a poll and essentially uh, everybody agrees that uh, this is something that we should do uh, like among the our reading group. Uh, so at least a, a lot of us want to actually bias uh, the, the presentation of the data in favor of a, a view of the world as we want and we would want it to be rather than how it currently is. Mm -hmm. What do you think of uh, of people saying that uh, algorithms are not biased, but it's the training data that is biased? Yes, yeah, so, so in a sense, um, I, I guess the question is biased with respect to what? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when you say biased, like you, you you suggest that there's some something you want to achieve, and uh, the bias drives you away from this thing you want to achieve. Now the thing you want to achieve could be a description of of, uh, of, of the world, and uh, in this case you can have data that are biased with respect to the description of the world. That's probably what occurs whenever you go on social media or when you read the media that shows mm -hmm. uh, a biased view of how the world is. But arguably, uh, with the example I gave, uh, we even want to create a bias with respect to how the world is towards how we think the world should be, or at least towards how what we would consider as more desirable uh, recommenders, uh, recommendations. And, and, and this would correspond to adding biases. Yeah, so quite similar to, to what we just said about uh, manipulative behaviors, that what to robustly beneficial algorithms would be manipulative, but uh, in a in a good way, in a way that we desire them to be, and uh, and same thing for uh, recommendation engine or search engines. They they should be biased in a direction that we that we find uh, beneficial. Yeah, uh, I think it it, it raises uh, a more fundamental question, which is the the question of uh, what is an ethical decision or recommendation. Uh, more, more generally, and uh, well, I think our view here is that uh, it's one that's robustly beneficial to something like mankind or or, or life or something like this. Um, it's very hard to to go into the details, but uh, I think it's useful to keep this in mind as a like that as a a more fundamental terminal role that we may have in mind, and then there are these. Uh, more uh, instrumental goals uh, like, uh, like transparency or or, or debiasing when it's biased with respect to uh, to uh, how the world is or something like this. Like th these are instrumental goals, but um, they are just part of what we really want. Uh, arguably, okay. The next uh, the next part in the article was uh, concerning uh, transparency, which is mm -hmm. a topic we already talked about in previous. Uh, previous episode of the podcast. Uh, the idea of transparency is that because these algorithms take a, take a huge number of decisions and as we have discussed so far, these decisions have ethical uh, implications. It, it, it's completely uh, crazy that uh, 
these most influential algorithms are totally unknown to us, to the public, to the unknown to the government, unknown to, to most people, while they have such a large impact on us. And uh, so requiring these algorithms to be more transparent in the way they, they, are, they are doing things is, a, is a definitely an ethical question uh, uh, for, for our own good, for the good of everyone. Uh, uh, this algorithm need, need to be made better. And uh, if, if they are more transparent, we would s somehow see the, the way they can fail and, uh, and improve them. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah, I think, uh, well, we already discussed this a lot, but uh, transparency has a, a lot of uh, advantages. It can be uh, verified, it can be audited, it can be corrected, mm -hmm. can be tested. Uh, yeah, but, but again, we also uh, raised uh, concerns about the full transparency. Uh, maybe it could uh, enable uh, malicious actors to more easily take advantage of, of, of the system. And uh, I think the, the example of uh, spam filters is an interesting one. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, so. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that there's a, yeah, this needs to be thought through and it's not that simple. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can refer to the previous podcast if you're, yeah. if you're interested in the topic. Okay. The, the next point in the article is something that uh, we never talked about before, uh, the, the question about uh, robots. So, so personally, I, I don't find it to be a very interesting topic because uh, I think this, uh, so specifically talking about uh, uh, mostly humanoid robots or robots that you live, live with at home. I, th I think it's something that uh, because it's not extremely scalable, it won't happen soon and uh, it will take time, but, but, but maybe I'm wrong. They, in the article, they, they, they mentioned two specific, uh, two specific examples. The, the first one is uh, care robots for elderly. Uh, this thing, actually, I, I know it's, uh, it's most, likely, most likely coming. Uh, I know people doing research on uh, developing these kind of robots. And the second example is uh, the example of sex robots. Uh, what, uh, while reading this, uh, this, this part, I was mostly scared about the fact that this uh, this engagement we would have with uh, robots that look more alive compared to a to simple screen of a laptop or screen of a, of phones would simply increase uh, even uh, maybe a, a dup dup, uh, what do you say would uh, would multiply the emotional engagement we have with uh, with these uh, algorithms so. Uh, or already the the social network recommender system they, they they try to pick content that is uh, emotionally strong for us and creates either addiction or anger and definitely look for the content and that make us interact more make us uh, engage more with the with these small things like phone and laptops and if a, if a robot has access to this kind of uh, information to this kind of uh, data to this kind of algorithms to to select content for us, then I'm afraid it, it, they would simply be a lot more addictive, a lot more engaging, uh, a lot more emotionally uh, disrupting for, for society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, like, like, uh, yeah, so uh, like, like you, I don't think that uh, robots are as concerning in terms of AI ethics than uh, social, like a uh, recommender system, for instance, that are much more scalable and affect the. Uh, billions of people with uh, very customized, uh, well, it's already big. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's still, very inter it's still interesting to think about the robots uh, as themselves. I, I'm not fully really convinced by the greater engagement thing. Uh, well, I think, I think that, well, I think it's an interest, it's a possibility, but uh, like, I, I feel like people can react a lot to, uh, to things that are very virtual. Uh, so, so at some point, for instance, there was the example of, of Tamagotchi that was given. Uh, so Tamagotchi is like really this uh, stupid, well, stupid, not, not stupid, but this very simple game uh, that uh, a lot of people had where you had to feed this uh, virtual pet uh, and take care of it. And people 
like, like many people engage with this. I think uh, a, a lot of people uh, also uh, like have, have some quite some empathy for a Pikachu they have on, <laughs> on that Pokemon uh, game, uh, and, and and maybe there can be uh, applications on the phone that can be very. Uh, they can really uh, work on this and, and 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 serve as as care companion or or maybe not sex companion. But <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure how critical the Android uh, part is to engagement and uh, emotions. There's probably uh, so uh, the, the talks about robots and agents that are often uh, suggested to be embodied as a robot uh, i believe it's a there is like an over representation of, of the team robots in, in ai ethics ai safety especially outside and uh, machine learning researchers and uh, i also feel like that uh, the danger comes from decentralized non-embodied like i would I'd rather i'd rather fear um a recommender system than uh, than a robot that they can localize in front of me <laughs> Like uh, if you just like them, like just think of in, in terms of fantasized um, science fiction scenarios, it's better to deal with the localized, embodied, uh, compact, self-contained agents than to deal with a decentralized, non-embodied uh, upload. <laughs> yeah, uh, like just like something as stupid, a recommender system. And and, and I think we sh we sh we should keep pushing on this direction, where people care more about non-embodied decentralized um, uh, and uh, r robust agents because th that, could, that could not be localized and, 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 and contained and confined and uh, yeah. yeah that's why there is often this misunderstanding that uh, yeah. there is no risk coming from AI because we can simply if we see that it's going bad pull, pull, right. pull off the plug right. you can't and, pull uh, off the plug of a recommender system yeah, so. And can you see if it's going bad? I mean, it's <laughs> which oh, which plugs? Oh, all, all the plugs yeah. around the world. <laughs> I, I, I always give this, like, uh, yeah, just uh, addiction. Like, um, try to switch off the algorithm that makes your teenager kid addicted to a social network. You can't. Yeah. But, Sometimes, uh, even uh, if it's a Game Boy, I just have one button to, <laughs> to press. Well, at least the Game Boy is like the Game Boy. If I, I didn't have a Game Boy, but I don't think it was connected to any network. Yeah, if but, you kill the single Game Boy, the kid loses all the content. Yeah, yeah but, but but I mean, if your parent try to tell your kid to 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 kill, but like just to switch off its Game Boy, it can be very very hard for him for, yes, for, for the, the kid. Like, for her. It's uh, not because the Game Boy is a very sophisticated killer machine; it's just like it's addictive. Hmm. No, yeah. like, so like imagine, for example. Imagine you have a teenager that has a very complex relationship to his or her or social media presence. Then even like as a parent, you can't kill the social media presence by just killing the smartphone <laughs> because everything is backed up and the kid could just find another smartphone and, and get back to the addictive or to the toxic community or to whatever was not very good for their mental health. Yeah. Uh maybe one exception to this uh, and this is uh, another section of the of the article is um, uh, like autonomous cars and and uh, auto autonomous drones um, especially autonomous drones like we talked about this also in the previous uh, episode but uh, the diff the, well, the important difference is that there can be a, a lot of them uh, the, you can imagine like a fleet of uh, millions of uh, of kilo drones and now it's like like each of them is localized, but there are millions of them. It's harder to to, to protect against against them. Uh, and I think this is a much bigger concern than uh, human like uh, human looking androids. Yeah, I agree. So in another section of the paper, they they also mentioned the the concept of uh, employment and automation. So it's something that's a uh, often uh, feared uh, concerning uh, artificial intelligence that they, because they allow more automation, they, they allow for jobs to be replaced. Uh, from uh, what kind of shock from on society can we expect? So uh, one that has been observed is that between uh, 
the year 1800 and uh, the year 2000. Uh, it used to be that most of the population, uh, around 60%, was working in farms. But now we are in a completely different society where less than 5% of the population works in farms. Uh, the question concerning uh, development of artificial intelligence is whether similar shocks will occur and, uh, and change the landscape of, uh, of the job market uh, as significantly as that. And, uh, and because it's quite an uh, uncertain uh, area, how can we try to anticipate it correctly, prepare for it, and, uh, and make sure that things happen in a, in a good, uh, desirable way? Uh, all, uh, all big questions. Yeah, uh, and I think we see, like we also like the current COVID situation is uh, uh, well, it's really affecting the way people work, and uh, unemployment is going to be an issue. Uh, so uh, like I think that um, yeah, we we need to 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 consider uh, uh, like solutions for at least the possibility of. Uh, Increase of uh, unemployment. Uh. Yeah, one of the one of the main concerns also is uh, increase unemployment and also increase of inequalities. The yeah. the already rich and powerful companies that will then be able to automate more, to produce more, and use less uh, uh, workers, the higher less people for for producing the same thing uh, would simply uh, become more and more productive. Uh, and in, in the end, like you can think that uh, all of these uh, technologies will uh, are just like allowing us to to produce uh, abundance, to produce a, a lot more with uh, much less work. Uh, this has been a, a trend uh, since uh, the dawn of, uh, of mankind. Um, uh, so we have all of these good things uh, that are coming in, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, we should. Think of how to redistribute uh, all of this, uh, of all of this work, uh, in the best possible way for the good of all of mankind. Yeah, yeah, this is a uh, definitely uh, an important topic. So they they mentioned in the in the article the the what they call the age of leisure, which would be a time when uh, we automate it sufficiently that uh, most people don't need to work anymore and. Uh, and everything from food, shelter to entertainment or, and leisure are, are all provided uh, to to everyone, uh, no matter no matter what you do. And this is one of the huge reason to, for example, the, when the, when we talk about AI risk, some people think of uh, stopping to do research on AI and and simply would, uh, would solve the risk, but. We would lose this uh, this opportunity to do extreme, extremely large amount of good from uh, from this kind of technology, and, uh, and this is extremely valuable. Yeah, and and life without computer computers or computing, <laughs> uh, the one we know of at least uh, is like back in the beginning of the twentieth century, and was not that uh, pretty for most people uh, back then. Okay, do you want to extend more on a? Uh, on this topic of singular, the singularity. Yeah, yeah, we can discuss a little bit uh, the problem of singularity. Uh, so, uh, well, the, the idea of, of uh, the singularity uh, would be that uh, some AI systems become uh, uh, extreme, like super intelligent, and they were uh, very, uh, very capable, and they, for instance, uh, are able to produce. Uh, uh, better AIs than we, than researchers in AI uh, could. Uh, they can solve uh, any uh, task, uh, at least information processing task, uh, better than any human can. Um, and if this happens, uh, then, uh, well, we have to, to expect uh, a lot of changes in, in the way we organize uh, many things in our society. Uh, I mean, a lot of jobs uh, these days are, are, are about uh, problem solving or solving, yeah, solving some challenges, organizing the information, uh, making decisions. And so if you have a, uh, an algorithm that's able to do all of this better than any human, 
uh, it's definitely uh, going to completely upset uh, the way we live. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, a, a case where, uh, well, just like as algorithms are becoming more and more powerful, uh, there are greater opportunities, but uh, arguably, but also greater risks. And uh, in a sense, like the volatility of what can happen is increasing. And uh, it's, it's becoming more and more important, I'd say, to do moral philosophy and to, to make sure that things are, are really going, in, uh, especially like robust moral philosophy, to make sure that things are, have a very high probability of going in the right direction. Um, yeah, and I think just the, the risk of a singularity should increase our, our concern to do a, a moral philosophy on the deadline and, and making sure we understand what ought to be done not only by every human, but also by any system uh, in the organization and particularly in the machine. Great. Let's conclude. Unless you have something to add. No. Uh, so next week we discuss what? Um, uh, the online fight between anti-vaxxers and pro-vaxxers, right? Yep. So it's a good topic because uh, when we wrote the book, many people told us, like, like I, I don't know for lay, but when I gave talks and I used the anti-vaccine example as something we don't want to happen on social media, people told me like, how much is the impact of this? Like, uh, how, how this is this is peanuts, and uh, like, how many people are really dying from this? I remember like a talk at uh, at Berkeley, and I was asked for like, like why why I'm like insisting on an example that has so little impact. I hope now the, the current COVID situation <laughs> changes yeah. this, uh, this, this perception of how dangerous the anti-vaccination movement can be, uh, especially that like now we're heading, um, we heading for a big backlash uh, once the vaccines would be developed. Like, the, the anti, like there are reports that the anti-vaccine movement for COVID is already, like it's, it's growing faster than the research on a vaccine. <laughs> Not good, yeah. <laughs> There's a community built about around the resisting the, the COVID vaccine that is getting ready faster than the researchers are getting ready to deploy a vaccine. And yeah, so uh, yeah, clearly that's that's something we don't want recommender systems to 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 be bad at. So we don't know what the recommender system should do, but at least they do they shouldn't do something that is obviously bad. Like, yeah. When you search, uh, like, are vaccines good for your health? And then you provide, uh, like, even if you provide half the answers yes and half the answers no, that's clearly a bad thing because you won't find half the, the researchers on, on vaccines and virology and viruses saying uh, the vaccines are bad. Like, you would find maybe two or three among uh, tens of thousands of respected researchers that went rogue once they retire and start having some strange positions on, on vaccines but um yeah recommender systems are clearly not good on this topic like this is this is a topic where you can very easily say that recommender systems are not good All right so thank you and uh, i don't know if you want to conclude no no that was a conclusion <laughs> so thanks for listening to the podcast and uh, see you next week bye, -bye. see you yeah.